morning, everybody. Um, welcome to day four of the virtual um, IUCN Peatlands Conference. I hope those of you who have been um, involved in this over the last few days have had a really interesting time. This is the last day um, where we're really going to focus on the sustainable management of peatlands um, and explore through the day um, the, the compatible land uses um, that go with healthy and restored um, peatlands. So more resilient systems can be more, more multifunctional. They can provide a range of services, um, but it's important that the, um, the balance of those, the methods of management and the intensity of management is um, considered. And that's what we're going to be exploring today around farming, sporting, recreational uses. So are all positively compatible. Um, equally, there are some areas of learning where um, it could be that it's best for nature to be left um, to, to run its course. And that's the most sustainable thing to do. And the knowing about the when and the where's and the uh, balancing of that, the speakers today have got some experience that they'll, they'll be sharing. So today's sessions... Um, uh, are going to be around um, people who are working in, in practice in this in this area. So sustainable management in the UK, in Yorkshire, in the Outer Hebrides and, and in the Southwest in this morning session. Um, later in the se sessions later in the day, um, things about heritage, finance, forestry, renewables. How does sustainable peatland management interact with, um, with those land uses? There's a... Further later on, thinking more around the climate risks to peatland and the opportunities from them. Um, and then the day ends uh, with a um, sort of rousing roundup of all of the different international action that is happening um, to care for our peatlands, which is um, really exciting and um, scaling up at quite a rate now. So very exciting things to come today. So um, just to give you a little introduction to me, um, I'm Rachel Bice. I'm the Chief Executive of Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, who host the Yorkshire Peat Partner which has been um, in uh, action for over a decade now um, across Yorkshire, doing all sorts of different things and learning a lot in the process. It's been a real uh, voyage of discovery for the team. And we're also involved in the um, establishment of the Great North Bog in, in Northern England as well. So that's what sort of brings me, me here today to, to facilitate this session. Um, so we've got a series of speakers, um, which um, partially are going to be speaking live, partially are going to be on video. Um, we also have a QA and a session at the end. So if you can um, put your, your questions in the into the box, the Q&A box, and then they'll be moderated. So we'll, we'll be displaying them as they come through. So if you don't see it immediately, it's just because it has, there's some stuff in the background that has to be done to make it then become visible to everybody. So please put your questions in there and then we'll choose some of those to our speakers at the end of the session. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll start with, with our first speakers. So our first speakers are it's a, a double act of Jordan Stanley, who's the project lead for um, the Lowland Agricultural Peat Task Force, um, which is, sits within DEFRA Soils Peat and Policy team. So important thinking about policy. And Robert Caldwell, who is a um, Lincolnshire farmer, also um, deeply involved with the Association of Drainage Authorities is chairing that um, grouping and of the Lowland Agricultural Peak Task Force. So very much immersed in thinking about how do we um, make improvements for this um, habitat type and land use. Um, and he's got 25 years experience of water level management. So um, lots of um, wisdom for them to share. So we're going to listen to their video now and um, then we'll, we'll be back with you shortly. Good morning, I'm Jordan Stanley and I work for DEFRA, the UK government department responsible for the environment, food and rural affairs, which has oversight of policy on peatlands. This May, as part of a series of announcements we made on nature and climate, we published our England Peat Action Plan, setting out the government's long-term vision for the management, protection and restoration of all peatlands in England to deliver benefits for our wildlife, people and planet. This plan provides us with a blueprint for the actions we have and will be taking, from the development of a new baseline peat map to a consultation on ending the use of horticultural peat. If you'd like to hear more about DEFRA's wider peat agenda, you might like to listen back to Monday's Four Country update. Restoration is certainly a core part of our overall vision, but where restoration to a full peatland habitat might not be possible, we are proactively seeking a more responsible approach to peat soils management. 
Sticking with this as the theme of today, we're going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about our peatlands under agricultural use, with a focus on our lowlands, which produce the highest emissions of all our peatlands. In January this year, we established an independent task force to explore how these peatlands can be more responsibly managed. The overall aim of the task force is to develop solutions which can retain our peat soils, both to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to support continued profitable farming. This lowland agricultural peat task force will report to government in summer 2022. Its findings will then be for the government to consider. Right across the country, the task force is now bringing together farmers and land managers, water management stakeholders, conservationists and academics with the government and its agencies. The group is coordinating work already underway and exploring new solutions, whilst fully considering the unique circumstances of our different lowland peat regions, mainly those in the east, southwest, northeast and northwest of England. And the task force also has the support of experts in polluter culture, who have been tasked with developing a commercially viable roadmap to wet agriculture. For those of you on today's call who'd like to hear more about the journey of the task force, I'm now going to hand over to Robert Cordwell, Independent Task Force Chair. Thanks very much. Good morning. My name is Robert Cordwell and I'm a farmer from South Lincolnshire. I have 20 years of experience in flood risk and water level management. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, local internal drainage board. I was chairman of the Anglian Northern Flood and Coastal Committee for 10 years from 2005 to 2015. And I'm currently chair of the Association of Drainage Authorities. In January, DEFRA asked me to take on chair of the Lowland Agricultural Peat Task Force. I took that on because I'm absolutely convinced of the importance of sustainability. We're seeing events around the world now of catastrophic events, whether they be fires or floods. And I think these, all of the science tells us that these, these events will get worse if we do not act to reduce the carbon and greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So the emissions from lowland peat, we know uh, account for 88% of all peatland emissions. That's eight and a half million tonnes of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The need for action is absolutely critical and not in the long term but now. The task force brings together a number of stakeholders from the farming community and land owning community uh, through scientists, through conservationists and it is about bringing together people and forming a partnership to tackle this issue in a sustainable way. The regional groups are led by local peat champions who are farmers and landowners who are passionate about this issue in their local communities and I've asked them to create partnerships in their local communities because I believe that this issue is best tackled with scientific advice and that is where the strategic advice from the task force but it's best tackled at a local level by bringing together those partnerships and I'm really pleased to see how those are developing and how when I get out and about and visit some of these areas which I'm able to do just starting to do now following the pandemic uh, how the, the, the passion for change and sustainability is really evident right across these communities. The evidence shows us that water level management is key to reducing emissions. And that is absolutely something that we are very focused on. Uh, 
really happy that we've got senior personnel from the Environment Agency on the flood risk side and water level management side who can really advise us on what is possible there. This is going to require um, to be quite innovative and I'm so pleased to see how many farmers and landowners and other organisations are really innovating in this area and I do think that they are well ahead of other parts of the world and they are really looking at this in a holistic way. They're not looking at this to just displace production elsewhere and it's not our problem because it's a global problem and we all have to deal with this. So I am so pleased that that implementation area of actually finding ways to be sustainable going forward is really working well. It is only going to work if we all pull together as a partnership, because if we don't, I can see that this will not become uh, something that uh, d gets delivered in the short term that we need to do. There are solutions, and I believe there are sustainable solutions out there that will still allow a profitable future for landowners whilst reducing those emissions. We're working closely with Natural England on the peat map, and uh, you've been told by Jordan about uh, the work that DEFRA are doing on that. So I'm really pleased that actually we're seeing some local uh, initiatives, particularly from Cambridgeshire County Council, to actually make a more detailed mapping of the peat in their area. That is critical to how we take this forward. We have to know what we're dealing with, whether we're dealing with just um, deep peat, but also some of the skirt soils. The science is running very hard to catch up with some of the issues that we're dealing with here. And I think that that is something that we, the task force, can constantly wants more information on the science. Uh, thank you to Jordan and Robert for sharing um, those insights there. I think absolutely key messages are around us taking action for sustainability. That action needs to be in collaboration um, and us under using all of our available um, technology and innovation to understand the problem and the solutions is, is part of it. We'll move on now to um, our next speaker, Andrew Walker, who is a catchment strategy manager for Yorkshire Water. He's been working um, alongside our team in Yorkshire, along with others, like many of the water companies trying to help do their play their part in um, restoring peatlands. So, Andrew, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk to you uh, for a few minutes about um, some of the history around uh, why uh, we're investing in peatlands and uh, towards the latter end of the um, uh, the, the talk, uh, we'll be covering potential opportunities for um, lowland peat um, and the work that we're doing with the food and drink supply chain, which I could think could be um, quite relevant. So my presentation's got stuck. <laughs> Hooray. Right. Um, so just a, a quick overview, um, five and a half million customers, 1.2 billion litres of water put into supply uh, every day, uh, and a billion litres actually needs to be treated and returned safely um, back to uh, the environment. We are a big, uh, big landowner. We own uh, about 50,000 acres of catchment land, second largest landowner uh, in Yorkshire. Um, and uh, what we've always tried to do is to um, balance the Yorkshire water estate um, and, and manage it in a way that demonstrates that you can achieve multiple outcomes if you work collaboratively in partnership with people um, 
to try and influence basically land that we don't own. So we own most of uh, Nidderdale and the Washburn Valley around Harrogate, but we own next to nothing down in the Peak District. So it's very important that we seem to um, embrace uh, all elements of our um, rural community um, uh, so that we can try, and, like I say, encourage those people uh, that own land that uh, we don't. Um, if we look at where we water comes from, uh, I first started looking at um, colour in reservoirs uh, probably 15 years ago. And that colour, as we probably all know, uh, comes from degraded peatlands. More latterly, uh, we've been focusing on uh, engaging with the farming community on the rivers to try and reduce the amount of metaldehyde, which is the active ingredient in slug pellets. Um, and uh, we've had some quite good successes, I think, in, in terms of engagement. Uh, and then the last project, um, sorry, the area that we're looking at, uh, again, with the food and drink supply chain, is trying to reduce or optimise uh, nitrogen use efficiency, um, which then hopefully makes farming uh, more resilient, more sustainable uh, and more profitable. We're very fortunate uh, to have uh, a significant amount of partners throughout our region, uh, from the, the, the various rivers trusts and, and um, wildlife trusts to the, uh, the stakeholders or uh, delivery agents, if you like, um, from most of the future uh, in the South and the Orchard Peak Partnership, uh, who have success successfully delivered for us uh, for, for well over a decade. Um, this is a, quite an old slide, but I won't um, apologise for it. For me, this is really important. It's about uh, building relationships and trust. Um, so on the left, uh, we have Paul Wilby that was uh, head keeper on the Bolton Abbey uh, estate. Uh, traditionally, um, they would apply for a licence to spray bracken and our water quality team would say no. It's their land. Um, and uh, it, it came to a head a few years ago. Uh, and I thought we have to change this. So we worked on a way to protect the, the reservoirs and allowed them to spray. Uh, and that fundamentally changed that relationship and allowed us to go up onto Upper Barton Moor and restore uh, what was our most discoloured uh, water source. Um, on the top right, um, we have uh, Richard Bennion when he was Water Minister, David, me, our former Chief Executive, and Kevin, the Gamekeeper. Um, this is important that when we take people up to see the work that we've done, I think it's really important that our tenants um, also get the opportunity to engage with these people. It could be very easy for me to say uh, we're doing a great job um, when I've had some fairly lively debates with David um, over uh, how, how the war has been managed. But I think you need to have um, uh, those sorts of debates. And then the bottom there. Um, we took the Board of Natural England up to, to see Keithley Moore. And if anybody knows anything about body language on the, the right there, uh, you can see David clearly doesn't believe a word I'm saying. He's got his hands on his hips. Um, and the important element of that is to really engage with the people that know that landscape best. Um, he said, well, if you try blocking that gully, if you'd have asked me about it, I'd have said you can't do it because it's a spring. So, you know, really, really important to engage with people that, that know the landscape best. Um, <clears throat> there are quite a, a lot of old hands, um, if you like, in, in the peatland community, but it's great to see some younger people coming through. Um, we were fortunate enough to get involved in what we called uh, Bogathon uh, in 2014, and that set out um, a process whereby all stakeholders stood on a piece of blanket bog uh, and said what does each of us need from it, and we identified five outcomes. Uh, there are probably a lot more than that. Um, and they were uh, water quality, biodiversity, carbon, grouse and sheep. And whatever you think of sheep farming or, or, or grouse um, more management, they are currently legal. Um, so it's important to us to engage with everybody. At the end of the three days on three different estates, it was obvious that the only habitat that routinely delivered all five key outcomes was a healthy, blank, a healthy active blanket bog with a lot less heather and a lot more sphagnum. So the, the people on the ground were telling us that and everybody um, agreed that that was where we want to go. So we could have done bits and pieces on the Yorkshire Water Estate, which may well have alienated people, but by working in collaboration and partnership with people, we actually came to a, a common ground, if you like, common cause, um, whereby we all benefit if we all manage the, uh, the more in a more sustainable way. Um, we've taken that thinking into the Yorkshire Water Estate. 
um, and developed the Beyond Nature programme. So that was around, for me, about uh, breaking down barriers, agreeing a consensus, developing a government strategy uh, and living that strategy on the Yorkshire Water Estate. Um, what we also did um, is expand the themes within Beyond Nature uh, so that if you uh, visit a Yorkshire Water site, you will hopefully in time see a Beyond Nature brand uh, with the various outcomes that we're, we're trying to achieve on that. So it might be flood attenuation, you know, it might be some uh, wild land down near a sewage works adjacent to a river, um, uh, but it could also be a nature reserve as well, so society and recreation, biodiversity, those sorts of things. So um, it's a, it, I, I'm really pleased that the, the, the company um, took that on board and um, uh, my colleagues, Lisa, uh, Carol and Liv are doing a tremendous job in rolling that out. Um, what have we? What's our commitment? Um, well, we've invested very significant amounts of our customers' money over the years uh, in the catchments that uh, you can see there. I think importantly, and possibly moving forward even more importantly, um, in Amp Six, we were able to support with Seven Trent United Utilities and Northumbrian Water two different life bids. Um, using our customers' money as match funding, which allowed um, those two organisations to um, extract significant amounts of money for peatland restoration uh, across the, uh, the whole of the Pennines. And again, uh, we were fortunate in a way that we had a significant programme in AMP7. Uh, that's over the next five years, the 2025, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and by having that money available, um, Tim has managed to secure um, a reasonable well, more than reasonable, uh, Nature for Climate Fund, uh, which is excellent news, and most of the future, and the team down there uh, are looking, or have submitted a, a discovery grant. And again, I hope that our match funding could be used uh, next year for a, a restoration grant. Um, we've also been working um, in the lowlands with the food and drink supply chain. Um, lowland peats haven't necessarily been our primary target, um, we've been very much looking at uh, nitrogen, potentially phosphorus, uh, but more latterly the option and ability to store carbon uh, in our lowland soils. Um, so we launched a, a project. Um, we've got three sustainable landscapes projects running at the moment. Um, the first one's been going for four years. That's dotted around York. The second one was a project, the Sustainable Landscapes Humber Project. Um, that complements the Living with Water Partnership. So we're trying to use the whole catchment as a sponge uh, to mitigate flooding further down stream in Hull by growing cover crops and reducing tillage. And the third one that we launched um, was uh, really quite bizarre in terms of coincidences. Uh, we launched that. We've been working with the B Carbon team in Texas uh, to try and develop and roll out what we believe is the world's first uh, certified soil organic carbon credit. Um, so that was launched at a David Hockney exhibition in Houston in Texas. And um, the one of the pictures on display there, the tunnel by David Hockney, was actually painted on the Harrison's farm. Uh, and there are our lead uh, farmers in that particular catchment. So it, it's uh, amazing how things, um, whether it's coincidence or meant to be, I don't know, but uh, super exciting on that one. Um, so unfortunately, we, we couldn't go to um, Texas for the launch. Don't know why. Um, but we have, uh, with Future Food Solution, uh, Solutions, set up what we call the Carbon Bank. Um, and this is about providing farmers um, with the metrics to be able to demonstrate that through growing cover crops and reducing tillage, we can supply uh, the food and drink supply chain with zero carbon raw materials, but also the, the uh, farmer could benefit from having a carbon credit to uh, recognise and reward uh, that movement in, in terms of uh, how, how they grow food. Um, the benefit uh, to us is that we have an aspiration to be carbon net zero. So, in effect, we can buy the carbon credits that the farmers in Yorkshire are sequestering carbon within our soil platforms. Um, and I think that's a really nice message to give back to our customers, saying, you know, rather than buy carbon credits from Brazil or somewhere like that, we're actually investing back in the landscape of Yorkshire. I think there is potential to uh, adapt this or look at it in terms of lowland peat. 
Uh, so we're keen to work uh, more closely with Jordan uh, and Robert about how, how this, this could transpire. But more latterly, we've been talking about whether there might be an option to have a, an upland carbon credit for peatlands. Um, this, this should complement the peatland code, but there isn't currently a way to reward people for sustainably looking after carbon that's held within the peat. We think that the metrics that we've developed um, for the carbon bank um, could be applicable um, to, to upland peat. And we're in the very, very early stages of trying to see whether that would work. Um, and uh, again, it's um, another way of recognising uh, sustainable, holistic um, land management. Uh, for those of you uh, that haven't got this, uh, it's a, a shameless plug for the Good Soils Guide. Uh, it is free uh, to use. Uh, and whilst Yorkshire was my target audience, um, it's currently been actively contributed to in over 24 countries around the world. So uh, super um, resource for people. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the support for peak and restoration really does come from the top of the company. Um, ironically, uh, we were fortunate enough to take Liz up onto Fleet Moss at the head of Wharfdale. Um, and she actually wants to go back when it's absolutely hoofing down uh, to see what the restoration team with Jenny and uh, Tim have, have done to uh, slow the flow of water and vegetation and, and, and carbon off that moor. Not sure where we are on timing, but uh, hopefully I haven't overrun. Um, so thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, I think um, what's really important to note about um, what water companies have done in this space is that you've really been the early adopters of, of putting the investment in, which has enabled um, the innovation to come through and some stability in the system um, to be established for some of the, the teams that have been working on this over a number of years. So um, really very important um, contribution that water companies have made um, to the progress that we are now making and the foundations for that. Um, so thank you. There's a few questions coming through um, as well. I just want to remind everybody, please um, do submit your questions um, and you'll be able to see them coming through and vote them up and down which ones you really want to see um, answered in the in the end at the end of the session um, we will move on now um, to hear from um, Ben Inglis um, Grant who's the Peatland Action Officer Project Officer at the Carlaway Estate in the Outer Hebrides so um, really uh, this this work takes people to all sorts of um, far flung places, and Ben has been at um, the estate since 2018. Um, he's delivering this program for Nature Scott, um, and the life that he now leads on Lewis combines his earlier studies of archaeology and earth sciences with his family life and his career aspirations to really contribute to playing a part for the conservation and restoration of the beautiful um, Outer Hebrides in, in, in all sorts of ways. So we'll hear from him him now. And please remember to pop these questions in the chat as we go through. Over to you, Ben. Hi there. Uh, I guess one of the pitfalls of being a pre-recorded talk is I'm not entirely sure who or how I've been introduced. Um, but I have been asked this morning to speak to you about sustainable peatland management here in the Outer Hebrides. Um, so without further do a wee bit about myself. Uh, so my name is Ben, Ben Ingalls Grant. I am the Peatland Action Project Officer for the Outer Hebrides uh, and I've been working with Urus Outer of Carlaway since October 2018. Um, I, since then we've worked on three uh, restoration projects across uh, Lewis primarily um, and hopefully by the time this presentation is actually being shown we'll have machines out on site for our fourth site uh, at the behind Carloway uh, on the west side of Lewis. Uh, a useless fact about myself uh, going forward as well is I love useless facts so I'll be throwing a few at you as we go through this talk. Um, a wee bit more about Peatland Action uh, just in case you haven't come across us yet. Um, so we are a Scottish government funded program of projects, uh, so looking at delivering on the ground restoration across Scotland. Um, and since 2012, we've actually worked on over 200 sites and we have put 25,000 hectares on the path or on the road to recovery uh, with capital funding capital works and various other things, uh, projects and researchers that we've been involved in. 
Um, thought I'd give you a wee bit of context about the Outer Hebrides, just in case you hadn't heard of us. Uh, and if you haven't, where have you been? <laughs> uh, we are an island chain off the northwest coast of Scotland. We actually have about 70 islands in the chain, but only 15 of those have uh, are inhabited. Um, of the 70 islands, over 300,000 hectares of land uh, consist of the chain. Um, and of that, again, over 200,000 hectares are registered as peatland, peat soil or heather moor. So there's scope for restoration on a vast uh, area within the, the chain. There's actually a population of 25,000, so don't believe the reports that we're a barren and empty landscape. We actually uh, have quite a good number of hubs uh, throughout the chain. Um, and we actually have quite a relative, uh, relatively mild climate as well. Don't believe all the press about bad weather. Yes, we have storms just like the rest of them. We have heavy rainfall. We have prolonged rainfall. We have midges. But we actually have a relatively mild climate thanks to the Gulf Stream. Um, we have had a drought uh, going on uh, over the last few months. We don't think we've had any real rain since June, um, but it's broken in the last few days. Uh, and uh, looking out the window yesterday, it was bouncing off the road uh, quite high. So it suggests there's a huge volume of water falling in the last few days. Um, a little bit about the ownership and the management on the Outer Hebrides. 75% of the land here is actually in community ownership um, and most areas on the Outer Hebrides uh, are managed uh, are actively managed by a common grazings. Now common grazings have agreements with the landowners, the estates, private or uh, community owned estates to, to manage this land. There's an agreement that they will use it for the crofting, they'll use it for grazing etc. So there's there's ownership and there's management here uh, on the ground. There's other stakeholders as well. We have the RSPB, Scottish Water, Utilities etc. There's a, a few different players up here. And there's also a range of land uses in the Outer Hebrides. There's not just the crofting, sheep breeding, grazing, etc. There's uh, forestry plantations, there's food production, there's fishing, there's uh, activities like stalking uh, and shooting uh, on the states. There's a whole range of uses for the land uh, that go just beyond uh, crofting. Touching on crofting, crofting in the Outer Hebrides uh, is the traditional mainstay of the economy and that's because uh, throughout the years it has been the only way of survival. Without crofting it would have been virtually impossible to survive uh, up here due to the lack of resources and things. Typically a croft is only a few acres, uh, enough to hold some livestock, plant some crops, get you through the year and maybe if you had enough left over to provide a small income. Um, and tied into that as well is the peat. Uh, so the peat was cut for fuel. Uh, as there was no other uh, resources for fuel. Uh, so the peat was cut and used to heat homes, do the cooking, etc. Um, and it played a vital part in not just the survival of the household, but also in the calendar throughout the year as well, going from the, the cutting of the peat or the turfing of the peat, the cutting of the peat, the drying of the peat, and then taking the peat home. And it was also a huge part of the community as well. So there's a huge cultural and significant uh, attachment between crofting, the peatland, and, and just the communities in general as well. So we've had people uh, raise questions about peatland restoration in light of that. So it's been quite interesting having those discussions about how peatland restoration and traditional crofting practices can quite often work side by side uh, and not uh, impinge on each other. So generally speaking, when I've been interacting with common grazings or, or individual crofters, I get asked three general questions. So I thought I'd just quickly rattle through them here to give you a bit of an idea of the, the sort of the landscape up here. So first one, why restore peatlands? It's all well and good, but why bother? Um, come back with the stats of so 20% of Scotland's land is peat or peat soil, uh, peatland or peat soil, sorry, um, and of that 50-80% is in a bad condition. And it's the same here in, in the Outer Hebrides. You can see the, the degradation happening. Um, sometimes it's not visible from the road, so people are a bit confused as to why we're here restoring peatland. And there's also that confusion I touched on as well. Are we here to stop crofting practices? Um, the Peatland Action Project is not here to uh, restrict anyone's uh, actions or anything. If people want to um, cut peat in an area, that's fine. We'll do restoration somewhere else. Um, those sorts of things. It's not about stopping traditional practices. So why restore the peatland? It's in need of it. That's all well and good. You're employed, gives you a job, but does it actually work? Does it do anything? Um, one of the operators on the restoration projects that I talked about a bit earlier um, actually questioned the entire 
ethic of the work and why bother. Um, he was, wasn't convinced until he actually finished the last peat dam and was off site and could see that the water was being held uh, and slowed on the site. So he was a very late convert to what he was doing. Um, but I come back with a stat that I've, I've taken and, and altered from peatland action. So if we're able to restore an area of damaged peatland about the size of two football pitches, so just, just under one and a half hectares, we could save 19 metric tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions a year. Um, and that's the same, roughly equivalent to 361 round trips from the south of Harris to the north of Lewis. Uh, so, you know, four days off a year, you can Christmas, birthdays, for me, the FA Cup and the Champions League final days. Um, every other day, you'd be driving up and down and you would have the same amount of emissions. So that generally opens people's eyes and they start to see, ah, right, OK, there's, there's quite a big thing going on here with restoration. I touched on the final question, yeah, that's all well and good. We can believe the science and things, yeah, but, but where's the erosion? People driving on the roads around uh, the islands here don't generally see the erosion unless it's peat banks near the side of the roads because the erosions are happening further into the moorland or up on the hillsides. So yes, there's man-made erosion, but the natural erosion is taking taking over in the systems that are not being seen by man. So the, re the erosion is happening. It is there. We just have to get people tuned in to seeing where that erosion is coming from. Um, so that's been part of my, my challenge as well, is, is informing uh, common grazings, informing landowners that, yes, from the surface and a quick glance, the land might look OK. But when you get to a site like this at, at the top of Ben Bragger, some of these hags were up to our shoulders and the peat depth was disappearing. Uh, we were running out of probe depths. I think we only had two or three with us, but we were disappearing beneath our feet. So you're talking about a good body of peatland there and it's just being uh, eroded away. Uh, so that's where the project comes in. So I thought I would rattle through a couple of the restoration projects that I talked about. So just to give you an example of how we came to to liaise with the landowners, land managers, and then also shape practices going forward and how they're looking at changing going forward as well. So the first site here is Loch Horacy. Uh, so this is about five minutes south of Stornoway. Uh, on the, if you're driving on the main road to Harris, you turn off on the junction to go to the left and you see these three turbines and there's a water treatment works on the edge of the loch. So we have actually had two phases of restoration around this loch and we're hoping to scope out a third phase in the next couple of weeks. So um, that gives an, a sort of spoiler that the land management has been changed around the loch lately. Um, so this is our phase one plan. Uh, you can see here the, the, the two subsites, uh, the green and the orange. It was originally identified by Scottish Water. So uh, it's, this project has been in partnership with Scottish Water, Sovel Estates, Rannish Common Grazings. It's actually a lot of the background work had been done by the Scottish Water representative. So when I came into post in late 2018, a lot of the, the initial conversations had already, already been had, which was a, a real help to me coming in. Um, but we still had to have a couple of walkover site visits to, 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 to check what was actually going on in the ground, to check that the, the peat cuttings uh, in the area were, were, were old and abandoned and there wasn't going to be any conflicts there. So we walked over the site a few times with the common grazings, with the landowner, we had meetings um, and we encouraged this mentality of ask any question. No, there's no silly questions here. So we were getting asked questions about how high were our peat dams going to be? How how many uh, litres of water were we hoping to hold back? Were we hoping to do this, that and the other thing? Was it going to turn it into a, a, an impassable marsh and all these sorts of things? Once we started to have these open discussions and honest discussions about what the peatland restoration was hoping to achieve, particularly the common grazings, we're very happy for the restorations to go ahead. Um, so some before and after photos here. So the key the key for this shaping the management practices going forward uh, really was the early stakeholder engagement. We were able to work with the common grazings. We were able to work with any peat cutters who were in the area and were able to give them a chance to move to another area. So I should have said that about common grazings. Common grazings manage uh, quite a large area, not often or not always within one estate. It can cross estate boundaries, so they could have two landlords. Um, but they manage areas for grazing. They manage the areas for peat cutting, etc. So they are um, looking at different areas where peat cutters can move to. So if there's uh, an area that maybe has run out of peat, then they can move them to another area. So it's a similar sort of process here. When they've uh, allocated an area for restoration, we identified if there was any active peat cutters. There actually turned out to be three around Loch Horace, and we were able to have discussions with those three. One was finishing, wasn't going to be cutting anymore. One was looking to move, and one didn't realise what was going on and actually cut a couple of weeks before the restoration uh, event was due to begin, um, and now has moved to a different area. But um, 
we've had this discussion. We had this discussion about the grazing levels as well. The area is is, is rough grazing, or was or is rough grazing, um, but the grazing pressure wasn't wasn't high enough. It was negligible, uh, and the, the 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 effects on the site were were negligible. So the grazing is to be controlled on the area, but it's not being um, it's not shaping their their management any f harsher than that. They're just aware that they can't increase the stocking to a level that would be classified as as, as having an impact. And you can see here from the before and after photos as well. So we've got the two before photos at the top. Uh, the first one looking from the, the water treatment works towards the turbines. And the second one from a, a fairly wide peat bank with a drain at the foot of the base. Um, at the foot of the face, sorry. Um, they're not often like this. You usually only get an, an area of bare peat that's a year's cutting. This was a few years. It was almost a metre uh, wide. So you can imagine if there was all these peat banks doing the same sort of thing, that the, the water uh, is taking the peat off the site and into the loch quite quickly when there's rain falling on it. So we've got the before and afters there. You can still roughly see in the the, the one with the turbines where the peat banks have been. Um, and in the, the, the photo on the right there, you can see how the reprofiling is taken on. And you can still see roughly where the bank had been. So people are, are, are happy enough if they were to come back and say right this was where my my father's bank my grandfather's bank etc then they still have that location they can come to um to have that moment and the the, the management practices are, are shaped going forward as i've said the other site was i'm talking about was in arno so this is on the west side of lewis again this was uh Early stakeholder engagement was key and, and vital here. Um, I had an initial meeting with the estate and invited them to invite all of the common grazings along. And the, the clerk for this area came and at the end of the first meeting said, if I had an area in mind and we went to have a look at it just now, could we start the processes of surveying and, and you know doing restoration on it? So it took two years in total to get it from, from that meeting to the diggers being on the ground. Um, and in between that, we did all of our surveying. We had all of our meetings again with the common grazings. There was a peat cutter called Peter, ironically, who uh, didn't want to give up his banks at all. So handily, it's at the top uh, northeast corner of the site here. So we were able to take his banks out of the site boundary and put buffering work around it. So we've got um, cell bunding running around the top of it to, to slow the flow of water into the damaged, what will be a damaged area from the peat cutting. Um, the grazings as well, the grazing pressure was, was higher than Lahorese, but still low, almost negligible. So the practices here, the common grazings are, are, are aware of the, the need to monitor this site for another 10 years. So they're shaping their, their grazing uh, approaches so that the sheep will not be in these areas, particularly in the potentially damaging times when there's high rainfall uh, or drought periods and things. So they're gonna try and protect it as much as possible. All the peat cutting in this uh, red, boundary area as well is going to cease uh, and apart from Peter's peat banks in the top corner. Um, so this stakeholder engagement, this sort of mentality of asks no silly questions really helped build that confidence and is, is giving them the introduction to, to what best practice management looks like going forward. Touching on that as well, we've actually recently, the, the Peatland Code, the Carbon Credits, has really uh, made an appearance on the Outer Hebrides. Uh, there's been a couple of agents uh, pushing uh, the Peatland Code. So projects are now looking at the idea of, OK, this is all well and good. We can restore our landscape and be uh, effective and responsible landowners and land managers. But now is there potential rewards from that as well? And there have been trials recently for a potential outcome based agri environment scheme. So uh, if the, the, the land previously was an, an EECS agreement, an Agri-Environmental Climate Scheme agreement, then it may well qualify for the schemes that are coming next, which may very well then also reward better kept land and restored peatland landscapes and things. So these are going to shape management going forward um, and across the outer and across Scotland, I would, I would imagine. Um, but building on that is, is the trust and the connections we already have between the landowner, land manager and myself and, and other stakeholders. And these open and honest communications where we actually are bouncing ideas off each other and say, right, well, if we did this, would this work? Or if we did that, would this work? Um, would this have an impact, etc.? So that's been really useful. We talked about the controlled grazing as well. Peat cutting in this area uh, is, is ending. Um, apart from the, 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 you can see the black lines where the, the banks are impacted, where the peat cutter is continuing. So you get a rough idea of where we're putting in our, our mitigation methods as well at the edge of the yellow polygon. Um, 
in other areas in Lewis and Harris in particular as well, muir burning is a practice that's employed to remove fuel load from, from our peatland as well. So that's another discussion I'm having with common grazings as well, exploring alternative options for that, looking at heather cutting and baling, um, mulching, etc. These are all sort of relatively strange concepts. They've not really been done uh, for restoration or for these purposes. So it's an interesting conversation uh, at the moment. So the future, there's a lot that we can do working together, the shared partnerships, local insight into the area. Not only is it a way to tackle climate change, there's the multiple benefits associated with, with our uh, peatland restoration, improved habitat, improved biodiversity, improved water quality, etc. Um, and yeah, the action now is needed to, to get this delivered. So I'm aware of I've overrun time, but thank you very much for listening. And if you, I look forward to the, the question and answer session if there's any questions that come up. Um, and if you need to get in touch with me at all or want to ask anything directly, there's my email address and also our website for you to ask any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. Some um, really important work going on um, as nearly as far north as we can go for um, for peatland work in the, in the UK and some really interesting questions coming through on the, the Q&A as well that we can touch into a bit later. Um, for now, we're going to um, continue the it's the last presentation, which takes us back nearly as far south as we can go on peatland um, in the UK to the Southwest um, Peatland Partnership representative, who's Morag Angus, who's the Myers manager. So, um, Morag, over to you. I'd like to start by saying I'm not a strategist, an economist, a scientist. I'm a woman in the southwest of England who has been involved in peatland restoration for the last 20 years. I'm passionate about peatlands, about nature and our connection to nature and the na natural environment. So this presentation is a few thoughts as I see it in regards long-term sustainable management of peatlands in the southwest. Sustain, to support the life of, to support the life of what? Our culture, our heritage, our livelihoods, our habitats, our landscape, our planet, us. It is all so intertwined. So how do we as a collective come together to get that long-term vision and support of life that is connected to our peatlands. Having spent the summer behind a desk, I hear it wasn't a particularly sunny summer anyway, so maybe I didn't miss out on as much as I feel I have missed. Hmm, but I digress. So yes, I spent the summer working up a bid with my amazing team to enable further peatland restoration to be funded. Within the guidance documents, there were phrases like restoration journey and restoration trajectories, which I can't even say, and carbon saving for the next 50 years being summed up in two lines of a spreadsheet. All I can hope is that that isn't what our sustainable management of peatlands is supporting the life of. How, in my opinion, do we turn that spreadsheet of dust into the vibrant, living vision of our peatland landscapes 10, 50, 100, 300 years from now? One of the biggest challenges we face is how do we describe, illustrate, passionately and collectively create and involve everybody in the adaptive and changing vis vision so everybody is on board and supportive? We find it incredibly hard to imagine a landscape one generation back. How do we envisage, envisage and describe that landscape into the future? One of our points is that we need to think about our perception of a peatland, what that should and could, lo could look like on this island needs to change to be more open. With this in mind, I've compiled a few slides that I hope provoke some food for thought in regards how we support the life of our peatlands and their sustainable management in the southwest. In the southwest, one of the big questions we need to resolve urgently is what is the vision for these degraded, shallow, purple moorgrass dominated peatland landscapes? In certain areas, it could be debatable whether the ambition of restoring them to functioning blanket bog is even possible or the right vision. The scientific evidence indicates there are some areas so degraded that they may have gone beyond that tipping point of restoration being achievable. 
What I would say is it is worth carrying out restoration where we can, but what we should also be thinking about is how the other habitats beyond, within and adjacent to our peatlands are all connected. How do we bring about whole-scale landscape nature recovery and change our perception of what peatlands should and could be? We need to be much better at working outside our individual fields of knowledge and expertise to ensure a more holistic, rounded future landscape. On these shallow peatlands, can we allow the scrub that we in the conservation sector have spent the last 30 years cutting back, can we now allow it to thrive? Can we enable and encourage natural regeneration or planting of trees into valley mines? slumping peatland edges and shallow peats, as that would actually create a m more thriving, resilient, sustainable habitat and a landscape that is able to adapt to predicted climate change. The paleoenvironmental evidence gives us an insight into habitats of the past of which woodlands were a part, so maybe we should just stop trying to manage and manipulate them so much. Humans have been on this island for the odd or two and hopefully will be in the future. So critical to that sustainable management of our peatlands is empowering people to be and feel a part of them in a variety of ways. A small example of that in the southwest is our local peatland partnerships, which bring together a whole gamut of organisations and individuals in which the peatlands of Cornwall, Dartmoor and Exmoor are discussed people with different interests, backgrounds and passions. It isn't plain sailing, it can be hard work. Opposing views are aired. But ultimately, I believe we are all after the same thing, that is, the restoration of our escapes. We just need to find a way at times to get through the treacle and come together as a collective to make some positive, positive changes in regards to the climate emergency and embrace the fact that peatland restoration is one way of doing that. Triple SI, scheduled monument, schedule five landscape, national park, common land, less favoured areas, and so on and so on. Our peatland landscapes have been classified, designated, had arbitrary boundary lines on maps drawn through them, on them, around them static moments in time made by somebody in the past. Triple SI, county wildlife sites, is the way they are described and mapped with hard edges as largely static habitats and features fit for purpose anymore if we need to make our peatland habitats more adaptive and resilient to change and see whole scale nature recovery. Schedule monuments, principal archaeological landscapes, can we allow the way we see that feature or landscape to change as it represents just one moment in time? Scheduled 5 landscape Oland, the physical activity of peatland restoration means we will create landscape change. And as peatland ecologists, we want to see change in that landscape because something ain't right with it now, as they are now. Are these designations fossilising damage? These are all challenges to sustainable management of our peatlands. How do we place values on these designations and areas? And at the end, does one tree the other? Who decides? Through our restoration planning in the south southwest, I would like to think that this enables us to think holistically about all these interests. It provides the opportunity for discussion, thoughts, survey, monitoring and research so we can continue to understand our peatland environments and the past, present and future impacts of our work. I'm sure a southwest farmer would have a lot of other things to say but these are just a few things I see that need to change to enable the sustainable management of our peatlands. In the southwest, we don't have the issue of vast areas of bare peat that need to be destocked in order to just stabilise the peat. What we do have is vast areas of purple moorgrass dominated peatlands. One of the restoration methods that is critical to the restoration of these areas is grazing by livestock. The grazing of the purple moorgrass opens up areas of vegetation, enabling the required eco-hydrological microenvironment 
environments to recover within these peatlands. However, a few things that need to change in order to allow that to happen are as follows. A mindset change about farming, that romanticised idyll of farming, of a shepherdess herding her flock from one area of moorland to another while sleeping in her or turf hut is no longer. So how do we get that targeted, managed mob grazing of purple moor grass? Techn technological advances like no fence cattle collars should help with this if we can just get over the hurdle of inconsistency and double standards about when and who is permitted to use them. Do we need to rethink what livestock or animals are used or permitted to graze and be on the moorlands? Agri-environment schemes, certainty, flexibility and a human touch needs to be there. Prescriptions that don't align in the handbook so computer says no but maybe a human being can see sense and enable that management to happen. The number of times I've nearly fallen off my chair because I've heard somebody saying, oh, doing the restoration, that's the easy bit, as you will have seen and heard over the last few days, but just in case, and to re reiterate on behalf of all the peatland practitioners out there, this is so far from the truth. Just because it is a nature-based solution doesn't make it easy, nor should it be thought of as being done cheaply, nor should it be thought of as a one-off capital intervention. That is, you build a few dams in a ditch, habitat restored, carbon stored, planet saved, job done, walk away. 20 years of working in this sector has shown me that for the majority of peatlands, there needs to be multiple inter interventions over a long period of time. We need to be honest and open to what has worked, what only worked half as well as we expected and what didn't work. Restoration methods change, improve and adapt to changing situations and thoughts. And that innovation has to be encouraged and allowed if we are to going to stop the decline of nature the loss of our peatlands and enable whole scale landscape support of life. We can't think about sustainable management without thinking about the materials and equipment we are using to restore our peaty landscapes. If I take our use of timber for constructing dams as an example, we are currently using timber that is felled from plantations that the Woodland Trust are reverting to broadleaf woodland. Surely a sustainable solution. But hang on a minute, that woodland is 20 miles away by road, which requires haulage by tractors and trailers because the lanes are too narrow for timber lorries. And then it has another 8 miles to or so to go on to site. And that has to be transported by diesel guzzling track dumpers, not to mention the diesel diggers doing the restoration works. We need to be having conversations with current and next generation of engineers to understand what they are already doing about converting diggers and tractors and dumpers to carbon free fuels, giving them the knowledge of the specification we need. If any peatland projects are out there out there or having these conversations, please let me know. Another example is, is our and the local farming community's desire to use sheep's wool more as a material for restoration, which would have so many environmental and financial benefits because at present the low value of a sheep's, sheep's fleece means that most are not being sold but being composted or burnt. I'm going to gloss over the issue of animal bride products and the rules and regulations that brings. But what I see is there is a real opportunity for us to come together as a peatland and farming collective nationally that goes to the wool, board, wool board, the sheep's wool insulation makers, the twine makers and the entrepreneurs to say this is what we need and turn it into a viable business and material. Rather than using coir shipped in from Indonesia, can we use that wool to make a twine or cord that we could also pack fleeces into so we have a homegrown alternative to coir logs? I know we have been having conversations with a few of you about this, but again, if anybody is already doing this, please let me know. 
My 15 minutes are nearly up and I haven't even begun to talk about how there needs to be a fundamental overhaul of funding in order to enable, and not as it currently does, prevent sustainable management of our peatlands. Which is lucky for you lot, because it's one of my pet hates and rants that my team have to listen to regularly. So I'll just stop and say thank you for listening and hope that my slides have given you a little insight into some of the things we are doing and thinking about in the southwest in regards to the sustainable management of peatlands and the whole scale landscape support of life. Thank you, Morag. And I think what Morag has really illustrated with that talk, I think, is the emotional work that um, restoring peatlands involves. It's um, it's often in quite extreme environments for people, but the love that they have for the landscape is something that's really embodied. And that passion is really important because what Ben was talking about, about making both the problems and the solutions visible to people who wouldn't otherwise see them, um, is really part of the work that we need to do to help that cultural change that Morag was also illustrating around, um, have we got the right policy um, framework for all of our habitats going forward if we want to restore and bring back the dynamism of nature because that's what we've eroded the ability of nature to maintain its own systems in healthy dynamics um, so are we helping or hindering in that in the frameworks that we're working in so now we're going to move to um, our question and answer session. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. I've got them on a, um, a tablet next to me so that I can and see them and bring some of our panellists in. Um, you've been voting up the ones that you want to see most um, answered, which is very, very helpful. And those that aren't answered will be um, put up and uh, answers provided, I think, in post-conference um, materials. So if you've had a question that you want to see answered that isn't answered now, that will happen then. So what I'll do is I'll just start working through the, the top rated questions with our speakers and make sure that all of them get, get, a, get a question um, before the session ends, which I think is about 11.20. So the most uh, popular question is for Andrew. Um, to what extent can Yorkshire Water say that peatland restoration has helped to reduce their costs, either in terms of reduced water treatment or in relationship to flooding issues? What are your thoughts on that, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> nice easy one to start with then. Um, it, it's tricky. Um, we have seen um, localised improvements in water quality, uh, but there are also significant factors going on within reservoirs that alters um, the makeup of dissolved organic carbon. Um, the, the sh I guess the short answer is that we're not seeing water quality benefits on a, on a landscape scale. Um, however, that should not dissuade us from um, investing in peatlands uh, in the longer term because they've been degraded over many decades and possibly longer than that. Uh, they are natural systems. They don't recover on their own, but with a bit of help, they, they definitely recover. Um, so I think if we look at um, peatland restorations from what we call a six capitals uh, approach, we know that water flows off a more a degraded more 10 times faster than it does off one that's been revegetated. So whether that's our responsibility, I'm, I'm not sure, um, but I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable and our chief executive is, is reasonably comfortable in investing in peatland restoration for the longer term. What we don't know is if we'd done nothing, what would happen in a changing climate? So I think it's an investment in resilience um, and it comes along with all of those other uh, benefits, not least supporting rural communities, which I'm they're quite passionate about. Thank you. Fundamentally, it's the right thing to do, isn't it? And um, and the water companies have the ability to be um, important actors in this space and they're taking their responsibility. So I think that's really seriously in doing something which I think is appreciated by, by all of us in the industry who are involved with you. So thank I'd you. I'd just like to, to add another point, Rachel. Uh, the stuff that we're doing in the lowlands, but I, I am a lethal combination. I'm half Yorkshire and half Cornish, which makes me very, very mean. Uh, so I've always uh, been trying to find a way for other, other players uh, to invest back into our landscape. So I think the stuff that we're doing with the food and drink supply chain is relevant. Uh, and uh, if we can find markets for them in peatland restoration, I think we should. 
because I don't think our customers should foot the bill for all of it. Thank you. A great point. Yes, really important point. And um, yes, while you've been early adopters and are catalyzing things, it, the responsibility has to move more broadly into society, doesn't it? Which actually leads us on nicely to our next question. And I think I'll address this one to Ben. Um, so how do we make the fundamental shift on our lowland peatlands from drained areas back to wetland landscapes? Importantly, taking, well, taking people with us at the speed necessary to address the climate and ecological emergencies. So your experience in a small community probably will, will illuminate a lot then. Um, yeah, it, 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 there's no right answer for this and it depends on your location and your context and also the f people who you're engaging with. Um, the, 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 I guess moving the fundamental shift is, is, is there's a, for me, there's been a two-pronged uh, attack. It's been telling people where the erosion is and what erosion is like, because people haven't really necessarily been seeing it as erosion. Um, and the other aspect of that, talking about drained areas, the, there's a conversation I have quite often as well as management practices. 20, 30 years ago, people were paid by the meter to put drains in across peatlands to make them more uh, financially viable or whatever. Um, and now I'm coming along and saying, well, there's an opportunity to pay for restoration. And they're confused by these uh, sort of two different strategies mm -hmm. now. So getting people to see that, yes, management practices have evolved and changed uh, is, is part of the battle to really... Uh, getting that shift um, and getting it as well. There's a, there's a bit of a, f a fear lagging on from that because areas have been drained previously. People feel like it has to remain drained to become, uh, to be viable. Um, but actually saying to them, no, to, to, to re-wet it, to restore it, to make it a healthy and active peatland is actually more viable because of all these other benefits that they maybe weren't seeing before or hadn't been explained to them in, in that same sort of um at some sort of same sort of scope, the speed of things uh, that that depends entirely on on where you are uh, and who you're working with. Um, I have one group who uh, I've spoken with for as long as I've been here, and we're still no closer to actually getting a restoration site up and running. And then I've had a group who I was speaking to only a couple of months ago, and we're already at a point where we're planning out the restoration phase and looking to put out tender soon. So. Um, it really depends on who you're working with, but being aware, I think in my talk, I emphasise quite a lot about stakeholder engagement is, is knowing who's who's there and who's doing what um, will really help you to, to speed that along. Um, and it's using all of the tools at our disposal, isn't it, about understanding people. So important um, as was being illustrated about to understand what, what needs to happen in these landscapes, but how it happens and how we involve people is also a big part of the skills required um, in teams who are doing this work. Um, so I think next set of questions, um, there are a few that sort of rely on the, the, the framework that we're um, working in really. So I'm gonna go first to Morag to um, illustrate just more, do you want to open up a little bit more about what you were saying around the myriad of designations for fossilising damage? Um, because there are a couple of other questions then around um, the Peatland Code and the IDBs and their role. So if you want to talk a little bit about the designations and then we'll go to Robert and maybe to Andrew about the codes and the, and the IDBs. Yeah, I suppose with, with designations, it's the sort of, there's so many of them uh, and at times they can see seem opposing in terms of objectives. Uh, and I think it's just how we we look at them all and think about what what the challenges are that we have now and what how quickly we need to be reacting to them in terms of the climate emergency so that we can actually say, do you know what, that triple SI designation or that, that landscape uh, designation doesn't work anymore and actually we can still have some of those features remaining there but we need to make it a more sort of adaptive landscape uh, that we can and not not be sort of stopped by doing work because it's got a designation on it really uh, and um, yeah just be more open to what it is we want from these whole landscapes uh, to make them more inspiring and engaging and you know they'll still be able to be farmed and people will be able to access them so i think we just need to get rid of some of our fears that we have about these these designations and say do you know what it's all right if they change uh, and and let's just go with it and see what happens really so 
sometimes the fear people have is that if any designation is at all questioned, that it would be, be opening the floodgates to very damaging land uses, isn't it? And I suppose for our policymakers, the question is, can we create some insulation around these sites while we do decide what is an appropriate future, which doesn't undermine the protection that they've currently got now? Um, and I think that's something that you know I'd like to see across the whole environment sector going forward. So um, it's great to have some case studies coming through from particular habitats habitats about what we might what we might need so that's great thank you so like um similarly around the um how do we take ourselves going in in it gets ourselves going in the right direction there's a question here around rather than create a new upland code which could take years to develop and accredit would it not be easier to add water metrics to the peatland code and andrew you um touched on this um in your talk could, have you got any views in relationship to that uh, well, as I alluded to in my, my first answer, um, if you're suggesting that peatland restoration uh, improves water quality quite quickly, it unfortunately doesn't. Um, so I think in principle, it, it's a good idea. Whether you're looking at it uh, from a water flow, water retention, attenuation perspective, um, I think that's probably got more legs to it. Um, it's... I don't know. It's, it's a tricky one. I think it is. I think the, the intent that is established in these positive codes and accredited codes of practice is right, isn't it? But the practice of actually making them happen and getting all of the right participants lined up to make them usable, particularly at the pace that we now need things to work out for the climate and ecological emergencies, is something that's a real challenge. And I think we're going to have to um, find new ways of working in our sectors and cross sectors to be able to um, enable things to happen. One of the areas um, that's generated a few questions is around the role of um, the internal drainage board. So Robert, I think this is definitely one for you. Um, so we've had a question about, do we need re-wetting re -wetting boards as part of the role of drainage boards? Um, a question around, are the underlying principles for IDBs now outdated and that this needs to be um, urgently addressed? And, and are IDBs aware of this? Is there an awareness in the in the cohort of people that are leading them? Um, and I think there was another one as well, which I can't quite see, but you probably have got some views broadly around the roles of IDBs going, going forward and, and reflection on them. So it'd be great to hear those. Thank you, uh, Rachel, and uh, absolutely, uh, I think those roles are developing into uh, water management roles, if you like, and I think um, the terminology about drainage boards, um, you know, alludes to people who are just taking uh, excess water away and draining land, but actually the future and, well, the present really is about water management and in my visits around the country, I've seen where boards are, have actually managed um, higher level water. Uh, and that's something where they really are going to be key to this. Of course, they don't exist in all areas of, of lowland peat. But where they, do, where they do exist, that water management and uh, being able to manage the resource that we have, because actually... You know, our, our water resources, of course, are under stress as well. So this is going to be a big issue. And so managing that in a responsible way uh, is absolutely key. Uh, and I think that, yes, the boards do understand that. Uh, the engineers certainly do. And they're going to be key to these uh, solutions in managing this. And I've just come back from the Netherlands, actually, and their water boards are also doing this and, and actually managing their water resources. You, we often think of the Netherlands as a very wet country and not having any water stress. They're really starting to actually look at that and uh, reverse drainage to actually get water back into the land because they've had periods of drought where their production has really suffered and their soils have suffered. 
Yeah, I think it's re- that's really fascinating, Robert. Thank you, and thank you for illustrating that there is an awareness of um, the need for evolution in the the drainage mm-hmm. boards. I think um, we are we are quite good in the sector of uh, pointing fingers at each other and saying it's those people over there. But actually, we've all the collaboration point that was made earlier. We've all got mm-hmm. a role to play, and evolving uh, evolving that is important. And um, and learning to live alongside water in a different way um, when it's both uh, causing us increased risks from flooding and droughts but actually is a really big part of the solution for all of the things that we're talking about I think is really really important so yeah thank you so we've got a couple more minutes so um just going to look for a couple more questions um let's have a look so there's a question here is around um yeah, maybe all of you might want to say uh, something around the cultural change that's needed to encompass a real change in the hearts and minds who of those who have an understandable ingrained bias about peatlands management. So um, I don't know whether each one of you just wants to make a comment about the thing that you think would make a, the biggest difference for us to um, get that cultural change towards positive peatland management in the future. So, Robert, should we start with you? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I think anybody who doesn't understand this now, um, having seen the, as I said in my presentation, the catastrophic events around the world, that we need to act um, on our carbon emissions, really hasn't been watching any of the news programmes for the last um, 12, 18 months. Um, you know, I've just, as I said, I've just come back from the Netherlands And we had presentations from our friends in Germany and Belgium about the tragic loss of life there due to flooding. Absolutely unprecedented rainfall there. We also had uh, presentations from our friends in Spain and Portugal where they've suffered uh, five years of drought. I mean, these are things that if we don't uh, all pull together and start to all act and do our part, they are going to get worse. And we are not immune from these effects in this country. So actually, as I go round, I find that very, very few people aren't aware of the issues. It's what can I do and how can I help and how how can I take part in that um, responsible, sustainable future is what people want to know. Fantastic, really good points. And our job partially to, to give them those answers to some of those questions, isn't it? Morag, um, we've just got about three minutes left, so we'll be quite quick for, for the others if we don't mind, but it'd be lovely to hear from you all. Yeah, I'll say just building on from Robert's point, really, is that, you know, we get rid of this sort of, uh, you know, them and us uh, sort of mentality. Uh, you know, we do all want, you know, I fundamentally believe to mm-hmm. sort of restore our peatlands and to, um, you know, manage, you know, the best for nature. So I think let's not, you know, continue these arguments between them and us and let's just all come together and and, and get the best for, for everybody, really. Very well said. Ben, do you want to add in? And then Andrew can have the last word. Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, building on that point even more, that there is this assumption that it, it, it's all right where we are. So uh, let's carry on. Uh, the way we are um so explaining that in terms of you know the tesco every little helps you know that even just doing a small shift in this area could have a bigger impact across a, a wider area um not just in our own context but across the globe so yeah there's there's a huge so it's almost like empowering the, the, the people to to do peatland restoration and get on board with that it's sort of i'm seeing that with the restoration projects I've, we've got here is it, people are now seeing what was meant by peatland restoration and are now seeing how it can be applied elsewhere. So those sort of case studies of work that's already been done that we can share is, is a really powerful tool to help shape behaviour going forward. But then also sort of explaining how it can uh, how it can help is key. Mm, thank you. Great. Andrew, quick quick couple of words from you. Yeah, you'd almost think this was scripted. I think we need a, an integrated approach. So it's peatland restoration at the top of the catchments and then don't please don't i know this is peatland conference but please don't forget our lowland arable soils they have a massive potential for mitigating flooding events Um, if every farmer in the uk grew one cover crop a year 
that's potentially 130 million tonnes of carbon uh, sequestered uh, without interrupting their farming practices. Fantastic, really neat point um, to close us on. Thank you so much, everybody, um, all the speakers for um, taking the time to present and to being here for the question and answers. And to the audience who have been with us asking questions um, and listening in, thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Um, we've really enjoyed the session and we'll see you again, um, no doubt, in future. So thank you very much, everybody. Much appreciated.